trying to think, because I know a lot of the grad students are into machine learning, kinds of control theory stuff. Um, so I'm trying to think of the best way to show like manifolds to bring that up, because that's week two stuff, and it's what we use the rest of the time. Um, for instance, let's see. You have configuration spaces for different degrees of freedom for things. So for a pendulum, um, you have a configuration space. Namely, you have position and velocity. And really, you only care about the position of your configuration because you can take derivatives and stuff. And you have some structure and topology to deal with that. Um, but you think of having one degree of freedom in a typical pendulum. Because you, know, you have this sort of deal, and it can oscillate. These directions, of course, flip all the way around. Yeah, there's some kind of symmetry where if you flip all the way around one time, you end up right where you started, and so you have the same energy level and everything. And so you have this one number that kind of determines what your position is. So the natural topological space to think of um, as the configuration space is what's called S1, which is a circle. So there's different ways to look at S1. Using the terminology that we built in weeks one, week one's material, the natural way to think about it that I usually used to think about it is as a subset of the complex domain. Um, you can also think of it as a subset of R2 to the plane. So S1, the easiest way to initially understand this is as a subset of R2. And we define S1 to be this. X, Y in R2 such that X squared plus Y squared equals 1 is the unit circle. Now, this inherits, you know, I can draw this, right? I can draw a plane. Let's say this is X, this is Y. I have a natural topology on this, which is derived from the topology in R. So it's a, it's a product space. This is, for us, R cross R. <clears throat> and in the lecture notes, we develop how to get a topology on this. So we can talk about open sets in R2. And what they look like is just patches, right? So the basis for that topology is just the open patches that form the boundary. So I can have a union of those two patches, and I'll get something like this. Um, I can get interesting things that I can't get in the real numbers. Namely, I can get annuli. So I can get things like this. And we only have the interior in this case. So that's an open set. So this would be an, a union of open vaults, or open uh, circles, disks. Because right? I could cover it by one here, and then one here, and then fill in all these by taking account of the infinite limit to get the border patches filled in. Because every time I take a circle, I'm going to leave out a little patch of that. And just keep doing that, and then you can cover the whole thing. And so this is open because it's a uncountable union of open sets. So you can get all the different kinds of things. But namely, you have a subset of R2 that we've characterized here, which is the unit circle. And so this is a subset. So S1 is just a subset of R2. When we talk about subspaces as being subsets of a topological space, where you get a topology for free on that subset, and it turns it into a topological space. So how do you do that? Well, intuitively, it's really simple. The definition is kind of like hard to think about, but you know, if you just try to build it intuitively, what should an open set on the circle look like? Well, think about the real numbers, one of those open sets that we have. Give me one more example. <laughs> Is there one? Not including them? So that's one. So maybe if I try to put that on the circle, what should that maybe look like? Maybe something like this. Just this portion of the circle. Maybe this portion. Union something. Okay. So we kind of know what the topology on this should look like if it needs to match what we think of on R. 
Well, it turns out that the way I get this is by taking the subspace topology inherited from R2. So think about the open sets in R2. You, know, you have patches. Some of them might not touch the circle at all, right? Of course. You can have them far away. Um, you can have the empty set. You can have all of R2. And so I'll just shade the whole thing in the case. But I can also just you know take one that intersects the circle in some way. Intersect it with the circle. What do you get? You get this patch. That's an open set in the subspace topology on the circle, inherited from R2. Now you can embed, or sorry, immerse the circle in different spaces um, and then give it a subspace topology. And sometimes it will agree with this topology that you get, sometimes not. We say that this is the standard topology in this one. The other way I like to actually construct this that I can use a proof easily, because here I have two numbers and it seems like that's too many. Because I could reduce it to one and make equations so you can just make it. So I might embed it in the complex numbers. Now you probably have worked with complex numbers yeah. before. So you know the polar one. Have you seen complex numbers or the plane one? Seen it. So you have one number, right? And you describe it Complex numbers generically, uh, A plus IB, where A and B are real numbers. Um, there may be zero, so it might be purely real, maybe purely imaginary, depending on whether B or A or zero, respectively. Um, but you can draw a diagram, and in this case, it would just be A here and B here. This is called an argand diagram, like arg and A R G A and D. Maybe it's got its name, maybe it's not. But uh, that is the same description as here. I'm still using two real numbers to describe the complex numbers. So for instance, zero would be right here in the plane, the complex plane. You would have one, one, or excuse me, one plus i right there. You would have the number one real right there. This a is one, b is zero, one is zero. You could have i right here, negative i is down here, and so on. Just linear combinations of A and A and A. Sorry, one and I. So the way that you usually want to describe things um, in polar coordinates in the complex numbers is the following. This would be equal to another description of the same number, like even this one. R times E to the power of I theta. And theta is just the angle as in the unit circle. R is the radius. <clears throat> and it turns out you can actually show that um, if you think of the Florent series expansion of E to the X, that this will actually converge uh, to the same thing that you get like, you know, Agnes property. This is uh, Euler formula, I guess. So you can see that I get my A as R cosine theta, and my B as R sine theta. And you can prove this using um, the McLaurin series expansion, the exponential function. Oh, yeah. I learned that proof. Yeah, when I learned this, I was like geeking out over it. <laughs> I was trying to do all kinds of crazy algebra stuff with it. But it, actually, this idea that you can take weird stuff and stick it in the exponential function, we'll use a lot in, in these um, reading group meetings because we're going to extend this to not only plugging in imaginary numbers, but in fact, we're going to plug in matrices into the exponential function. And then we're going to plug in these things called infinitesimal generators and Lie groups into those. And those are generalizations of matrices. And then we can actually solve PDEs that are not solvable otherwise using them. So it's extremely powerful. You can derive Green's functions without even knowing what Green's functions are. Yeah. Okay. No knowledge, just algebra. Super cool. And it's one method, and it works for like basically every PDE. So throw your PDE class in the trash. <laughs> Once we get to that stuff. Will we go and die in this? Book? Yes. Throw your room in the trip and make the first thing we get to. <clears throat> um, so, 
Go from UNG. Hey, so let's dive into that topic. We're just talking about configuration spaces of uh, robots, pendulums. So, um, I don't know if you have you have disparate access, so you know like where the lecture notes and so far. No. Hey, I have to be extra careful when I broke down this unit. I forget what I was about. Anyway, that's. I, I usually characterize it as. Um, well, this is the configuration space of the pendulum. And I know it seems a little weird to think of the pendulum as being complex number of values or something. Sure, I mean, it's a circle in the plane. So. Yeah. But it's easier to describe with one number, and the easiest way to do that is um, it is E I theta in C. Much easier that way. It's just as far as constant. It's one. Right. So, okay. And it lets me think of you know, there being one degree of freedom. I can do differentials and stuff. Much Okay, Aram and Kevin, do you guys know what a topology is in the four axioms of a topology? The definition. So, things set. Because I think we're starting with point minutes, right? So, um, <clears throat> so, the idea in topology is I would like to take sets and I would like to give them some kind of pre geometric structure. I would like to make them into some material items that I can analyze the material properties of, so to speak, spatial properties. Um, and one thing you often do when you're looking at materials or you're looking at any kind of spatial thing is you care about parts of the space that are close to each other and far away from each other. So it's not natural for us to think about points in the space anymore. We're now going to think about little patches of material. Okay. So if you know on a sphere, you might think of a sphere as being covered in little patches that I can look at. You know, you might put little uh, coordinate systems on these individual patches, like X and Y, locally and stuff. Um, and then you can look at intersections between the patches and see how the coordinate systems need to change and that kind of thing. So that's kind of in the theory of manifolds. We're going to get to that in session two. But um, we need some axioms first, like topology. So the idea is I can take any set and I can put a structure on that set called a topology, which is so. Uh, take x set. Uh, let there be a subset t of the power set of x. So t is called a topology under the following conditions. You have four conditions. First is T has to have the empty set inside. Okay. Empty set is empty. Two. Um, the whole set has to be empty. Okay. And if you just have those two, uh, you have what's called the discrete, the indiscrete topology. So you always have on any set one topology called indiscrete, which just contains the empty set and the whole set as elements. But in order to get a little more complicated, I need some more constraints. I don't know if you guys can see me now for slowing off any direct smiles. So, um, if you take any arbitrary subset of the topology with index set i, say, so this is a subset of x. If this is in the topology, that implies that the union of the elements, the union of the sets, must also be in the topology. So this can be finite, countable, uncountable. If you have any two particular um, sets in the topology, those must admit an intersection in the topology. So we call elements of the topology 
got elements of the topology of the sets. So that's all we need. And the discrete topology is the simplest case, which is you just take the entire path set. So you have two topologies, assuming your set is a complete you know, a singleton. This stuff about bases and sub-bases is kind of not that interesting. Um, in college algebra, we tell people open sets are just, you know, this thing, A, B, where A and B are in the extended real numbers, so maybe negative, positive, infinity, they may be collegial. So you can get the empty set, you can get all the real numbers, you can also get rays in the real number line. Um, or just intervals, finite intervals, bounded. Uh, but this isn't a topology, this doesn't give us a topology. So, what I'm saying is, um, so A and B are in the extended reals, which means they may be negative or positive infinity. I think what notation do we usually use? Probably just topology closure. Whatever. Um, this is not a topology, it's what we call a basis for a topology. And what that means is, in order to get a topology from a basis, you must take all the arbitrary unions of elements of that basis. Okay. So the closure with respect to unions. Well, it turns out that when you do that, you just get disconnected patches of open intervals, and that gives you a topology on the real number line. So generically, um, a open set in the real numbers looks like this. It's an at most countable uh, union of open intervals. Countable is possible because, of course, you can put a small open set around every integer. Um, you cannot get a, let's see how it is. You cannot get an open set that is made up of uncountably many connected components. It's not possible because of rationals being dense and countable in R. And every open set has to contain uh, a rational because of the denseness of the rationals. I have no proof of that thing. Um, so that, yeah, that's that's a basis. And a sub-basis is much nicer. So I'm going to make a set of three elements. And Will brought this up earlier. Um, or it came up in the example that we were looking at. So I have a set with three elements, and I'd like to put a topology on this. Well, a subbasis is the easiest way to get a topology, and all I need to do is I need to take subsets of the power set of the set, such that the union of those subsets gives me the entire set. Okay? So I want an open cover. Since I want to cover the set with subsets. So I might take this and this. Say. Now, in order to get a topology out of this, we call this a subbasis as long as it covers the set. I just need to take unions and finite intersections. So what are the unions? Well, one of them is this. I just take the union of the two, and then I take intersections, and I get that. This is not a topology. So any covering set is a subbasis, and when you take closure with respect to arbitrary unions, finite intersections, you get a topology. It's very easy to construct these things. Now, the useful ones are not constructed this way usually. But it is useful to know what subbases are. Everybody knows what metrics are. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> how do you measure distances in the real numbers? The distance between two numbers, you just take absolute value of the difference between. So, for defini definitionally minded people, some axioms or some requirements for something to be metric. So to take a function on, I should note this, if you have a set with a topology, then you have something called the topological space. Namely, the topological space is a set X with a topology on it, T, okay. <clears throat> Oftentimes, I'll just write X when I mean topolo topological space, and there are standard topologies on most sets, so we can just use what is obvious to use. Number line, the one that we just constructed, is the standard topology. Now, a metric um, 
is a function from a, so it's binary as a function, right? Binary operation on a topological space, and it maps into the real numbers. So let D be such a function, such that on, um, you always have this being the case. You need to elements of the topological space you plug into the function. Uh, you get the same result if you reverse the order. So this is the property of symmetry for a vector. So you've got positive definiteness. So you need that you can only get zero if and only if uh, x equals y. Otherwise, you get greater than zero. Okay. So you can't get negative numbers. And you have one more, which is um, so three requirements. And this one, I don't think we're going to end up using because we're not doing stuff with metrics too much here. Maybe if you're modeling a geometry rule, you touch that. Um, but if you have three elements of x, x, y, and z, in the case, then you have this problem. <clears throat> so in R2, I mean, you can take this example. You can use the Pythagorean distance. Right? You might put the line in R2 to get a metric because it satisfies so this is x, this is y, and this is z. The length of this is x, z. And we're just saying that this line has to be shorter than the length of these two added together. That's pretty obvious. <clears throat> Now, you can define a topology if you have a metric on a set instantly. It doesn't matter what metric it is, you always go. Um, yeah, so if I, if I look at R2, just to give an example, and I look at x1, y1, and I plug in x2, y2 is the second point. These are just two points in a plane. Uh, the standard metric, I guess the Euclidean metric on spaces x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 uh, minus y2 squared square root and I'll leave this as an exercise you guys if you want to can check that this is a metric right? <clears throat> there's another one where uh, you get one if the points aren't equal to each other and zero otherwise so that's a constant metric so that one's kind of not interesting at all so if you have a metric on a space, then you have what's called a metric space. A metric on a set, then you have a metric space. Okay. Like this. Now you can extract from any metric a topology by doing the following. Think about real numbers. You form a basis for a topology by taking the open intervals. And the open intervals have a center, each of them. And they have a radius, unless they're rays, right? And <coughs> Um, you can describe those as open vaults. So I'm going to define okay. so an open ball centered at a point x and with radius r is defined to be this y in the space in the set such that the distance between x and y is less than r. And it turns out that if you have a metric space, then this is a topological space where the topology, all right, sub D, just to denote that it's coming from that metric, um, is defined to be topology generated by the basis of, so you take unions of open balls. B and X R for all X and X and R greater than or equal to zero. Okay. <clears throat> now this gives you the 
same topology that we were looking at on R, it also gives you on R2, you take a point, you form an open ball, you get a circle. So that's an open set. You can take arbitrary unions, so I can take any space I want to fill up, as long as it doesn't have a boundary. It's missing the outside the outline to itself. And I can just fill up, I can take every point, and it's some distance from where the outline should be. Take half that distance, take all that radius. You can do that for every point inside this, and you'll fill it up. And so the union of all these balls gives you that space. That's set. So patches is what I'm trying to say. So that's the standard topology or the metric topology on R2. There's another way to build this up as a product space. I think we do that towards the end of the base stuff. <clears throat> so I've been talking about open sets. What's you know we have closed intervals. Should there be a closed set notion? There is. And so if you have a topology and you have so let there be a topological space and let U be an open set. Um, we define a closed set to just generically be a complement of U, an open set. So that would be X uh, set minus U. It is the generic form of a closed set. I want to do like two examples. In the real number one, um, so that give you a kind of basic close set. So think complements of open sets. So what might those be? Negative of zero close. And two close. So zero. Ah, sure. Wait, what? Is it there? Negative infinity to zero. Okay. So negative infinity to zero. Mm -hmm. What is it? And then two to infinity, you said? Yeah. Okay, so this is the complement of zero to two. Right? We took everything but this and put it into a set and we get a close set. Are there others? I just want to build some intuition. Close sets can be like zero one with zero one in it. Yep. Closed. Yep. So the typical um, closed interval prototype. You can have individual points as well. So I can just have this by itself. What about the following? Um, I take zero. And I take one, I take one half, I take one fourth, I take one eighth, and so on. The powers of two reciprocated. Would this be a close set? Yeah. Okay. It's fine. Um, for it to be, let's say, um, I mean, it's not an open set around zero because it doesn't include anything less than zero, and you can't find like a one over n with n small enough that n isn't going to have space around it, or sorry, that one over n isn't going to have space around it? Like, I mean, if you get really yeah, you're far, far in towards right. zero, there's still going to be a gap between yeah. your thing and the next thing and Okay, so in essence, what you should be looking for is how to fill in the gaps. So what is the complement of this look like? Well, the complement goes from zero to negative infinity, open. And then you have, of course, one to positive infinity. Well, these are two open intervals, so their union should be open. It's arbitrary unions of open intervals are open. You also have this in there. So this is one half to one. And between every two other successive um, points in the close, supposedly close, close set, uh, you can put another open interval, and then you can just union them all together. So enumerate each of these points 
stick a um, open interval between every consecutive pair, right, and then union those together. The fact that there's uncountable, excuse me, countably many of these uh, points that you're taking uh, open interval between doesn't matter because between every two points you can find such a thing. Now at zero it's a little different because there's nothing just before zero. So the, uh, the blue there is still closed, yes? Assuming I can show that the complement is open. Okay, yes. Okay. So just to be explicit, I'm going to do this. It's good to actually write these things out if you want to check if the stuff is open or closed. Um, so I'm going to take this thing, union, the following thing. It's going to be a countable union. Okay. And it's going to be, I should really also put, So again, this part, we got this part, we're good on these. And I'm going to include everything else in here. So that's going to be 1 over n plus 1 to 1 over n. And I guess as an exercise, I'll leave it a check that there's no real number that's not in here and not one of these points. can actually check this. You just take a real number, suppose what it is. Either it's 1 over 2 to the power of, I, I did mess up something with that description. If I had taken this as 1 third in there and stuff, and 1 fifth, then it would have been right, but it should be uh, 2 to the power of n minus 1 to the power of n. Yeah. Um, but you take a real number. Either it's over here and you're good, it's over here and you're good, or it's one of these numbers, or it's not, and then you use Archimedean property to show that one of these numbers is less than it, and then there must be one that's larger because it's somewhere between one and that number. Archimedean property tells you that that number is going to be um, subseded by uh, one of these blue points to the left of it, because these get arbitrarily small. So every number is either an open set or one of these. Is it possible to take a set whose complementary is not open? Yeah, of course. Take a um, close interval. Go ahead, take a point. Take just a zero as a point. So it's. Um, say it one more time. Um, Complement is not open, you said? Okay. Um, yes, just take an arbitrary open set that isn't either. It, Closed set whose complementary is not open. No, because we define closed to mean the complement is open. So we actually extract the definition. Um, we can give another equivalent definition that we'll see in just a sec. Um, yeah, so you use contradiction arguments quite a lot when you're doing stuff with these weird constructions that have like limit points and things packed tightly close together. Uh, so just for some Terminology, we've got closed sets. I call, let's say I want like a patch of the topological space I'm working with. So let's say we're working in R2. And I have a point, and I want to think about an open set that contains this point. What we call that is an open neighborhood of the point. Right? So if this is 0, 0, then this would be an open neighborhood of 0. That's just a common term here. You have something called limit points, which are extre extremely crucial. And when topology was forming, everybody defined everything in terms of limit points and didn't use um, open sets as much. It turned out later to be more useful to use open sets. So a limit point is the following x. T of the topological space. Okay. Uh, let A be a subset of X. Okay. Just an arbitrary subset. Designed to be an open set. Or a closed set. In fact, there are sets which are not open or closed, like the half um, open, half closed interval in R. Okay. 
Um, so I want to define limit points here. So a limit point of A is an element uh, x, I'll say, yeah, x is fine. And it has to be in x. It does not have to be in A. Okay? Such that every open neighborhood, all right, NBHD for neighborhood, and a common uh, way of doing that, or writing open neighborhood of x, is to say that u is a set, and it's in the set of open neighborhoods of x. So that's the typical notation that you use for this. Okay. Not all books do this, but some do. Um, <coughs> satisfies. So every open neighborhood of x, if it's a limit point, will satisfy. Uh, what is it? U intersected with A less X itself is not empty. So what are some examples? I have a point on the boundary. Not contained in them, maybe. Yeah, points on the boundary. So in real numbers, let's let's just look at this close the interval. If I take a point here, I want to ask, is that a limit point? Well, take an arbitrary open neighborhood of this point. Does it intersect with everything else? So I don't look at the point itself for that intersection, but I draw a small neighborhood around, and then I say, does it intersect with this set with this point taken out? It must, right? So this is an open, uh, this, is, this is a limit point of this. Now what happens if I delete the boundary here, and I just have an open interval? Is this point right here? Is that a limit point? So you're saying that I can find an open neighborhood of this point that does not intersect this thing. So just to be explicit, I'm saying we have an open interval 0 to 1 is 1 a limit point. And I should define this. Uh, the limit points of A is noted A prime. It's a subset of x. So I should be able to find a neighborhood. You're claiming that 1 is in 0 to 1 limit set, limit point set. So I should be able to find an open neighborhood of 1 that does not intersect this set at all. It's everything right up to 1, but not 1. And any neighborhood of one has to have everything right up to one on the on the left, left side. Some extra stuff too. Right. So you can't. It would always intersect. The... Always going to be some intersection. So a trick that will help us is to be rigorous is to use the fact that you can actually just prove this with the basis for the topology. So I just instead of looking at every open neighborhood, I just need to look at the basis, which is the open interval. So I only need it for one open interval. And I know that if one is in an open interval A to B, then we have this property. Strictly. Well, take the max of, so we're saying that this is U1, the neighborhood around one, that we want to show it doesn't intersect this. Uh, take the max of uh, one half and a. Uh, let's see, I'll show you that. So it should be a plus one minus a over two, which is halfway between a and one. So I'm drawing an open neighborhood around one. This is a. B. This number right here is just halfway between a and one. Um, so it turns out that wh whichever one of these is the maximum must be greater than zero, right? Because this one's greater than zero. And if this is the max, then the max is greater than zero. If 
This is the max that is bigger than one half, so it's certainly greater than zero. So this is greater than zero, and uh, they are both to the left of one, because this one is halfway between a and one. So they're both between zero and one. So they lie in this zero one set, and so you have an intersection. So this is a limit point. Now, next definition is I'm going to define A, same step, closure of A to be A union of the limit points. Okay. Just taking all limit points, adding it to the set, it's closure. So if we take the zero to one, I'll close that, what do I get? To the right. If I take the following, one over n for n greater than or equal to one. What's the closure of that? Irrelevant. Thank you. Zero is a limit point of this because I get arbitrarily close to it. Okay, so it's just one over. It's just the same thing, but also zero. Yes. Okay. So closures are nice. It lets us add the boundary yet. If you have a point in, um, if you have an element of the set which is not the limit point of the set, because think, like, you know, not only is the boundary limit points, but in fact, like, if I have 1 to 2, or sorry, 0 to 2, in the real number line, then 1 is also a limit point. So I can't make any open interval. The thing is, it doesn't intersect the rest of the set. So it's not just the boundary, it's in fact the interior as well. <coughs> and what was the terminology? So an isolated point of a set is an element of the set that does not have, that is not the limit point of the set. So it kind of makes sense why you'd say isolated, because it's in the set, but it's like set rate for everything else. Uh, exterior points of a set are in the complement. So if I draw a real number line, or let's just use R2 because it's always nicer. If I do an open set, or if I do any set, in fact, whatever it is, then let's call this A, and that's all A is. Then this point over here is an exterior point of the set because it is outside the set and it is not a limit point of the set. So it's kind of separated from that set. And I think that is all for the basic terms. There's also a boundary, but it's kind of intuitive. It's it's not an interior point. Oh, one more. And this is probably the most crucial. An interior point of the set. So we write A circle is the interior points of A. And these are elements of A such that there exists a open neighborhood um, I should do this way. open neighborhood of that point which is fully contained within A. So you might look at a set like this in R2. This would be an interior point because no, this is shaded in. This would be an interior point because I can find an open neighborhood of that point fully contained in this. And the boundary is things that have all the open sets intersecting um, the interior and the exterior. And they don't have to be contained in them. Actually, they do. I think Arthur was saying that he checked and most definitions require boundary to be contained within the set. But to me, I don't really care. I think sometimes people just say anything that isn't exterior or interior is a boundary. Ah. In, in the ambient space. Uh, yeah. So I give an example in the notes for the annulus. And that's page three of the book. Um, so the last little bit is like connected stuff. So in the real number line, I want to ask this actually. Take two open balls, or take two closed balls. So open balls would be boundary added them, so closure of them. And they meet in one point. Remove that point. 
is this connected? So what I'm saying is, can I put two open sets that are disjoint from one another around these, and each one contains one of this circuits, one of these disks, these balls, with that pointer. And so that's an exercise. But the definition of connected is a set is connected. So a subset of a topological space is connected. If uh, there do not exist, let's see, I should do this. If for all U, B um, open sets, if U and B, if A is a subset of the union of U and B, this implies that U and B are not disjoint. So what it means is if I use two open sets to cover the set that I care about A, which is the union of these two closed balls for the point group, uh, is it the case that those open sets which cover this set uh, must intersect one another? Can I get them to be separated? Probably. You can do this parametrically by saying just be half the distance from the y-axis uh, that balls are. So you can do this. This is a disconnected space. It's not connected. I can't find. Um, I can find two open sets that cover the space, and they don't. The other condition is that A um, has to be in both of them. It has to intersect both of them. And, because, you know, I can say, like, I have a connected space like this, clearly it's connected, and I could just put one of the open sets over here and then the other one here, and then you would abuse the definition and get that it's disconnected. And, um, So every space is made, or every set, in fact, is actually made up of connected components, which is the maximal set with respect to inclusion um, that is connected. So what are the connected components of this set? How many connected components are there? Pretty natural. You just count how many things are connected. Now, I'm going to do an R2 and do a really great set. So, think about this. And this oscillates arbitrarily by how many connected components does this have? I can give a parametric description of this, but it's in the notes. I don't want to write the whole thing because I think it's a long time. Yes, but. Um, this keeps getting, so if I zoom in on this, yeah. you'll know it like looks like this. Even this type of space still looks something like this sort of thing. Yeah. And it keeps folding over. So it never really reaches, it keeps oscillating tighter and tighter. It turns out it's still connected. I can't fit an open set around this part and an open set around this part that don't intersect each other. Yeah. <clears throat> It's not path connected. So what's a path? Path is, um, I think we need, yeah, we need a continuous function um, definition for that. I don't think we have time. So I might have to like do continuity and homeomorphisms um, at the beginning of next time, and then like the second half of the manifolds. Um, I tried to put like a categorical description topology category, um, and you kind of see, if you're familiar with that, like what the, homo the homomorphisms are, what's the isomorphism, or the initial and final objects. I don't know what to do about that, make it interesting, but 
Like I could look at arrow categories over it, but I think that's not. It's useful to build more complicated structures like CW complexes. But yeah, I'm just leaving a bunch of like exercises open in case anybody wants to do them. Some of them are non-trivial. Um, the one that says that this space here is not path connected is kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if people have worked that one before, but yeah, I suppose next time we'll look at I have a question. Is the empty set open and closed? It is always both. Why is that? Give me a proof. So, what if you have four axioms? Right. And you have a definition for open and closed, or for closed, I should say. So, to be open, you have to either be empty or the whole set. You're empty, so you're open automatically. To be closed, you have to be a complement of the whole set. I'm sorry, that is what you are. You have, to be, you have to be a complement of an open set. And the whole set is open, and so if you take the complement, you get the empty set, which is therefore closed. Okay. Um, connected components. In The only way to get a simultaneously closed and open set is to have a connected component of the set, or to be the empty set. Or to be the whole set. I think it's actually unions of connected components that are the closed sets. So it kind of violates your intuition if you're just used to thinking of like closed and open animals. I mean, maybe not actually. I'm going to slot into that. There's also this weird topological space called the Alexandrov long line, and they do something like you can think of the real number line as being built up of 0 to 1, uh, half closed and open, 1 to 2, and so on. And so there's countably many of those intervals, and you can somehow piece together uncountably many and get some kind of similar construction. And I think it loses paracompactness, which is a property that you use when you build manifolds. Um, it's much longer. Thank you.